welcome to an exploration of the Mass. This is Anne DeSantis, Executive Director of the St. Raymond Anonis Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. This is part two. And this is an endeavor of two ministries, Patchwork Heart Ministry and St. Raymond Anonis Foundation. I have with me the founder of Patchwork Heart Ministry, Bill Snyder. Bill, welcome to this this uh, series that we're doing. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm excited for part two, Anne. Uh, it's just a great series to be, you know, taking a look at the Mass from a, uh, a different perspective uh, on each episode. So uh, I'm excited about today and part two on the Liturgy of the Word. I'm, I'm real excited to be with you as always. So uh, thanks again for doing this with me. It's, it's a wonderful service to, uh, you know, our church. That's right. That's right. And it's wonderful to work together, two Catholic nonprofits coming together to evangelize and to make outreach. And this one, part two, is on the Liturgy of the Word, because this is a four-part series on an exploration of the Mass. And during the first one, we talked about preparing for Mass. So if you haven't seen that one yet, be sure to go back on Patchwork Heart Ministry YouTube channel and watch it, or at nonatus.org on the page that we have for the Mass, uh, this special four-part series. And so when we're talking about the liturgy, the word, it's it's made up the, of the readings of scripture of Sunday and the solemnities. There are three scripture readings, of course, and during most of the year, the first reading is from the Old Testament and the second reading is from the New Testament letter. So that's just like a basic idea of what is the liturgy of the word. Liturgy, the word consists of the first reading, the responsorial psalm, the second reading for Sundays and solemnities, the gospel acc acclamation, the homily, the profession of faith for Sunday solemnities and special occasions, and of course, the universal prayer. I'm just going to kind of make that known to our audience what exactly is the liturgy of the word, right? And there are certain ways that we can kind of prepare uh, to hear the, the word. And one of those ways, I think, Bill, which we can unpack a little bit, is by reading those readings in advance. Absolutely. And yeah, so let's just talk about that. If, if you have any thoughts on reading the the mass readings beforehand, yeah, I think we touched on it just a little bit in, in the last episode. But I think it's a good tie over, obviously, for this one to, uh, you know, just reinforce how important that is to read the readings ahead of time. And folks, you can go right to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, usccb.org to find them if on if you're on your computer and there's a host of different apps out there that allow you to do the exact same thing. So you can go to uh, USCCB website, you can find a, a Bible app like the Truth and Life Bible app, the one that I use, that has a section for daily readings and when you go to Mass on Sunday or any day of the year, you just can click that button within the app and read the readings. So you can do that at home, you can do that um, if you have the Truth and Life Bible app, you can even listen to them, believe it or not, or listen to the gospel, I should say, uh, because they have an audio, a dramatized audio of that as well. So there's many different resources out there for you to be able to plug into Scripture and really prepare your heart well. It, I think it's one of the uh, most important things that we can do going into the Liturgy of the Word, uh, just to help us understand what we're going to be hearing for the day. And then be able to meditate on it further at Mass, right? I think um, one of the big things that differentiates just reading the Bible at home versus listening to the Bible at Mass is that it's proclaimed out loud, right? It's proclaimed from a ambo or a pulpit. And that is really, really, really important because God is speaking to us from His Word at, at the Mass. And so if we have an idea of what it says before we go in to Mass, then we can really listen to the voice of God. And so that's the reason why I suggest to pretty much everybody that, that I, um, you know, talk to in ministry, when they say, hey, how do you want to get uh, another step closer to God in the liturgy? Well, start by reading the readings ahead of time. And it doesn't take all that long most of the time because the readings are rather short um, for, for most of it. I mean, it's not going to take you more than 10 or 15 minutes to prepare uh, well for by by reading the readings and I mean it, it, they're they're not all that incredibly long unless you're you know preparing for Palm Sunday or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. I mean, throughout the year there might be maybe a a couple you know a few mm -hmm. during the year that are super long, but yes, 
Um, that's great, Bill. Uh, and I love the way that you referred the app too, because I think there's so many resources these days that people can go to, to really become accustomed to and to, to meditate upon the words of scripture. And I think that's where we can grow. Um, and that's really what this series is all about, is how can you grow? How can I grow? How can Bill grow? Um, not only us, but our families and people that we know, how can we grow closer to God by attending Mass? And Mass, of course, the highlight of Mass is receiving the Eucharist, but the Liturgy of the Word, really, that's uh, God's inspired Word for us and how, like God's instruction book, right? You've heard people refer to it as that, the Bible, Holy Scripture, and gives us that like life lessons in the ways that we can live, teachings of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, another way, not only reading the scriptures, I think, in advance, but doing something called Lectia Divina. And that is where you, either yourself or in a group, maybe with your family, where you might read the gospel readings, uh, where you read it slowly and you take your time. You might read it maybe one, two, even three times. And as you're reading it, you're kind of picking out those words or phrases that stand out to you words that might challenge you, words that comfort you, words that speak to you. And I know that my family and I have been doing that for probably, I would say over the last couple of years, especially during, uh, since the pandemic. Uh, of course, we were home a lot more during the pandemic, just like all of you were. And we use that time to do that, just that, to read the scriptures and to do Lectio Divina as a family. And it really has made a big difference for us because um, there's a lot of resources also that give some meditations in terms of challenging us to live better lives. I can think of someone like Bishop Barron that not only does he have the daily meditations, but he also has a video that comes out on Sundays. Um, it's, it's like his homily, but you can also listen to him and it's a way to kind of tie it all together, like Bill said, reading the scriptures, meditating upon it, and then take it a, taking it a step further and doing the Lecti Divina. So I think that's a, a really great way uh, to grow. And I think when you engage your family, which I know I have, um, my children are older, they're in their 20s. I have one daughter that's still at home, but she really looks forward to it. Mm. I mean, she looks forward to the fact that we're going to take the time to to read read it over and so when you go to mass bill i don't know if you agree with mm -hmm. this but when, when, if you read the scriptures in advance and if you do lectio divina it really does come alive for you you pay attention right. a lot more don't you think oh absolutely absolutely and i think that it allows you to open your heart and really i don't want to use the word relax but it allows you to just be more prepared and allow the word of God to kind of sink into you versus trying to figure out what it's saying for the first time because you've already read it, right? You've already encountered it through Lectio Divina. You've already encountered it by meditating on it by yourself, right? You've already done that process. So then when you do go to Mass, you can just hear the word of God proclaimed to you, right? That's the beautiful thing about it. Just uh, allow it to wash over you like a wave. And so, absolutely, I agree with you, Anne. I think that uh, making sure 100% that you um, listen to the Mass and you listen to the words of Scripture in the Mass by preparing for it ahead of time versus trying to figure out what it said before and by encountering God through Lectio Divina is a great way to do that. So absolutely. That's right. 100%. And uh, as I usually do on many of our podcasts, uh, I always try to find resources, right? Because uh, Bill and I are just two people, but there's so many people who have written and done great things and wrote uh, wonderful words of wisdom on topics. So I did find an article that I thought would be helpful. It's from Denver Catholic and the article is called The Liturgy of the Word, The Lord Speaks to His People. And what this article does is it just unpacks uh, the different sections of the Liturgy of the Word and starts out with the first reading. And it says, I'm just going to read what it says here. It says, in the readings, the table of God's Word is spread before the faithful and the treasures of the Bible are open to them. So says the general instruction of the Roman Missal. 
further using the aforementioned table analogy. As we begin the Liturgy of the Word, we have our front row seat at this very table. And then it goes on to say that the first reading is usually taken from the Old Testament, the only exception being during the Easter season when it is from the Acts of the Apostles. As with every facet of the Catholic Church, there's a purpose for this. The words of the Old Testament help to paint a fuller, more vivid picture of what happens in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the divine revelation foretold in the Old Testament. And the first reading is generally connected to the gospel reading in some way, whether it be thematically or a prefigurement of Christ and the church. So I think that's just a beautiful way of looking at it. There's always a tie, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a tie. And so when non-Catholic Christians or just non-Catholics say that the Catholic church is not a biblical church, I, I think that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Bill, I think you probably have something to say on that. <laughs> Um, because we are a very much a biblical church. And I love the way that first reading ties in to everything else. It is so important that we are recognizing that. Often we talk a lot about tradition in the Catholic Church. We talk a lot about the fact that we have these, you know, beautiful things that stem back even before Scripture. But remember that it is our traditions that breathe life into Scripture, right? Through cooperating with God's grace and the Holy Spirit to put pen to paper, right? Especially in the New Testament, right? Like that is so important to remember that because the Gospels weren't written. I think the earliest Gospel that we say was written was the Gospel of John. And that happened in uh, around the year 90 A.D., Right? And then the other ones uh, followed suit later. So you think about that, that's 60 years roughly after the, after the Paschal Mystery. right? And so recognizing that there is an area of tradition that sets up Scripture is so, so, so important for us as Catholics. But remembering that it's that area of tradition, it's that area of oral tradition, that area of passing on the faith, that happens between the writing of Scripture and the action of Scripture that allows us to encounter uh, Christ more deeply in the Scripture as Catholics. So I would say Catholics are scriptural people and, and we are a scriptural church. So, as Anna, and I know you mentioned that when our Protestant brothers and sisters say, are we more scriptural? <laughs> you know, or can't you be more scriptural? I would say, hey, not only is scripture all over the Catholic Church, it's as a result of the Catholic Church being faithful to Christ and the traditions that we have. Yeah, well said, as always, Bill. And uh, 100%. And it's so true. And when a non-Catholic goes to Mass maybe for the first time and really, really pays attention, not just says, oh, this is all about, um, you know, the, the rituals of, of being Catholic and of, and, and of the Mass, which, of course, there are rituals in the Mass, but they're good rituals. But it is also very Scripture-based, really is. We spent at least half the time of the, of the Mass itself is on holy scripture and on that liturgy of the word. So that next part, which I was going to get to, is the responsorial psalm. And I'm going to refer again to that article I said from denvercatholic.org. It's a great article, by the way, um, on the liturgy of the word. And it says, after hearing God's word in the first reading, we respond not with our own words, but with beautiful words of praise and thanksgiving taken from the book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms is a collection of 150 sacred hymns used for both private and public worship in the Old and New Testament. And the psalm that's sung, or sometimes recited, during the Mass is thematically linked to the first reading. And so that's just a little bit. Of course, there's more that's in that article. But I think to myself that when I hear or sing uh, the Responsorial Psalm, to me, a lot of times it's a praise um, or it's a prayer isn't it, Bill? Mm. It's a praise or a prayer to the Lord from the Psalms and a way that we can uh, reach to God and ask in that prayerful way for whatever it is we're praying for or thankful for or, you know, some type mm. of a supplication to the Lord. So 
Um, I always love when I hear the uh, response for real psalm, and I especially love the singing of it too. A absolutely, yeah. There's something beautiful about singing to our Lord and and using the the words of Scripture enables us to respond to God with His own words to us. Right? There's this there's this uh, beauty to it when we reflect and use the Psalms, and it, it's kind of unique. Right, because throughout the other parts of the mass, we we use music that was from our invention, right? Like the you know processional song or the recessional song, or even the communion hymn. They're not necessarily scriptural. They they might have elements of scripture in it, but it's not you know exactly scripture like the psalm is, right? And so and so having um, that that beautiful reflection of using God's own words to praise God is very, very interesting and it's and, and it's unique and it in its placement in the Mass. Right? It's not a a song that was from our own invention or from our own mind. It it is, you know, God's word. And so when it's sung, of course, uh, you know, we see it come to life, but even when it's read, we're still responding to God. Think about it. We're responding to God with God's words to us. <laughs> and, and that's mm -hmm. something that's very unique, I think, um, to, to the liturgy, to you know, the Catholic Mass. It's, it, it's beautiful that we use his words to praise him. And there's something that's very um, unique. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a unique cycle that, that we see uh, in, that, in that psalm. Yes, I agree 100%. And whether you're at daily Mass and it's not sung, or whether you're at Sunday Mass and it is, uh, it's still a matter for us to pause, isn't it? It's a matter for, for us to pause, to pray. I mean, the, the Mass is the greatest prayer. It really is. And when you participate in the Mass, that makes it even more special when you really participate. Now, the next part I want to discuss is the second reading. And of course, again, <laughs> again, I'm going according to that article, the DenverCatholic.org Liturgy of the Word. So I do want to read what it says. It says, following the responsorial psalm, the lector further proclaims the word of God with a second reading. The second reading comes from the New Testament, although not always linked directly to the first reading or the gospel. It contains rich wisdom of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and his church. These readings are taken from all the books of the New Testament that, that aren't the Gospels, the epistles or the letters from St. Paul and other disciples, the Acts of the Apostles and the Book of Revelation. While the second reading can be understood independently of the other two readings, it often enriches the, the lesson to be found in them. So I think they're uh, words of wisdom again. And I've found over time that sometimes that second reading is a little bit shorter than the first reading. I mean, of course, there's always going to be exceptions, right? But it's it's another matter for us to pray and reflect. And a lot of times when people do Lectio Divina, as I said, that's that prayer, prayerful way that we can reflect on the Gospels. Many times they do it on the Gospel, but not on the other readings. But I do think that sometimes it's a good idea to at least do the second reading too, because there's a lot of information there. And I don't know about you, but I really do love the epistles and the letters from St. Paul and the other disciples and the Acts of the Apostles and the Book of Revelation. So, Bill, I didn't know if you had any words to say on that. Absolutely. I think uh, St. Paul has so much wisdom that we really need to plug into and listen to often, right? Like listening to God's word through the person of St. Paul and again, I keep using that phrase, this is God's word, but it's it's through his agents, right? Through those, those agents and great saints and, and holy men and women that, that authored the Bible. And so St. Paul has a wealth of experience. God used the wealth of experience of St. Paul for the bulk of the New Testament. The bulk of the New Testament is written by St. Paul. And, of course, the Gospels are of chief importance. We have the Book of Revelation. We have the other uh, epistles of St. James and Peter and all of these other uh, beautiful uh, you know, letters that are there as well. However, however, when, when you 
look at the wisdom and the experience of St. Paul and what he brings to the table as a man of God and as a, as a saint, as a convert, there is so much to, to listen to. And so, you know, really, I encourage everyone to read the New Testament, but pay special attention to the words of St. Paul because they, they have something unique about our times that we're living in, you know, because he went through so much of what we are going through, um, you know, trying to evangelize in a, in a world that doesn't want to listen, right? St. Paul has a wealth of experience about that. And so I would encourage people, you know, really delve into those, um, you know, Pauline letters. And I remember in college, I took an entire course just on the letters of St. Paul. <laughs> uh, I took a whole course just on the letters of St. Paul, and I found them to be so incredibly fascinating and so uh, wonderfully uh, rich for our times and our uh, place in history. So not only do I encourage you to read them, I encourage you to listen to them and pay attention to them at Mass, um, you know, and, and allow God's Word through that agent uh, St. Paul to come and wash over you like a wave because it is so, so important that we really uh, listen to his messages. And even if it's not connected uh, to the Old Testament and gospel reading, there's still a really pertinent message that God wants you to hear uh, in there. And I know my, my parish priest, he often, many times, many, many times, he, he preaches on the second reading and always includes a second reading in his preaching. Uh, because he recognizes how important it is. So, uh, absolutely, Anne. I think uh, this is something that we definitely need to, uh, you know, remain uh, faithful to and and reflect on and include in our Lectio Divina preparation. Yes, it is. 100% again, again. <laughs> um, now we're up to talking about the gospel. And uh, as I was before, I'm going to refer to that article because I do think it really unpacks it well. This article says that now we reach the gospel instruction of the Roman Missal called the high point of the liturgy, liturgy of the word, the gospel reading, the action that corresponds with the part of the mass indicates its sacredness. The congregation stands and joins in the alleluia in the, in the, with the cantor. The deacon or priest holds up the book of the gospels and processes in front of the altar or the ambo following the greeting. The Lord be with you and our response and with your spirit. We trace the sign of the cross on our foreheads and mouths and chest in a sim symbolic gesture whereby we ask for the grace to keep the Lord's word ever present in our minds and on our lips and hearts. I mean, that's pretty profound. I, I love the way that's expressed. I couldn't have said it any better, really. And then, of course, we hear from the teachings of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And it's a time for us to pay very close attention and this, as we said, uh, in terms of the Liturgy of the Word, this is the highlight of the Liturgy of the Word. And it follows with the homily. And I am going to read what it says about the homily so that we can talk about both when Bill comes back on. It says that the homily comes from the Greek word explanation. From very ancient times, the presiding priest would take time to explain the scriptures that it had been read, as it's seen in St. Justin Martyr's account of the Mass dating in the middle of the first century. The practice of following the reading of scripture with a homily wasn't something new for the Christians. The Pharisees had a similar practice in their synagogues and even know from the Gospels that Jesus himself partook uh, in, in it. So let's listen attentively about how the scripture readings can be put into practice in our daily lives and how God wants to tell us something that every time the word is proclaimed. So it's the Gospel and the homily this is what people remember when they go to mass that's what i would say of course we remember receiving the eucharist because that's the highlight of the mass but when people walk out of mass they remember the teachings of the homily the teachings of the gospel and of course we all know that there's priests that are good at it and priests that aren't so good at it and that's okay because we're there mostly as i said because we're receiving the body blood soul and divinity of christ and to hear the gospel proclaimed. But I think we can always pick even a tidbit of what that priest says and apply it to our daily lives. Even if you didn't particularly like everything that he said or it was too long or too short, there's got to be something that we can take from it. Bill, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's something that we can take from the gospel 
especially if we prepare well, right? Like we've been talking about that and keep harping on that. But if you prepare well with the gospel, you're going to be able to take something really well um, away from it, regardless of how the homily is. You know, I, I don't go to Mass for the homily. That, that's something I don't do. Like, I don't go to Mass to hear a great homily. Because, honestly, the homily could stink, but the, but the Word of God and the person of Jesus is still present to me. And he wants to come in and dwell with me and in me. And so that's the reason why I go to Mass. Um, and I think if we prepare well for the Mass, regardless of whether the homilist... By the way, it's not that the homily could stink for, 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 for you. It might be wonderful for somebody else, right? Because, because God uh, you know, is meeting a multitude of people there. Right, so it might stink for you, but it might be amazing for somebody else. And you know, God is speaking through through the priest and teaching through the priest in that homily. So you know, don't don't always you know go rush and judge uh, you know the priests based just solely on their homily, uh, especially at mass. I'll think that hey, you know what? I'm not the only person sitting here. God God is doing a you know. A, a greater work. So don't be selfish and think, oh man, I, that, that, that homily was terrible. I'm out of here. This isn't any good. No, the, the whole mass is really good. And if you've prepared well for mass and you've listened to the gospel and you've read the gospel, uh, you know, ahead of time, then you're going to get something from, uh, you know, that, that encounter with, with Christ. It really is an encounter with Christ. And I, and I wanted to share, um, you know, something that, I think of, and I think this will tie in as we, you know, move into the next episode in the liturgy of the Eucharist. I, and I, I was actually looking this up to find out when it occurs in our electionary cycle, and it couldn't occur in a more perfect spot. So the so the 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 Gospel of John, which many of us know as the prologue of the Gospel of John, um, is actually read in the electionary cycle for uh, Christmas Mass every year on Christmas Mass during the day. So that's John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And when you think about it, the reason why that is read is because it is the intersection of the, the Word becoming flesh. And so it is, it is so powerful. I just want to read it and, and reflect on it because this is what's happening at every Mass. And this is what happens in the liturgy of the Word for us if we're well prepared, if we're ready and got our hearts open at every single Mass, regardless of the baby's crying or the performance of the priest's homily or whatever else is going on. This is what's happening for us. And it, it's so true. Listen, listen to this uh, gospel reading from the Gospel of John, the the, the prologue of the Gospel of John. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing came to be. What came to be was through, was, through Him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God, for he gave testimony to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him. But the world did not know him. He came to what was his own. But his own people did not accept him. But those who did accept him gave him power to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, 
full of grace and truth. I'm going to end it there. That's that's um, verse 14, but the gospel reading does continue to uh, 18. Uh, and you can read that on your own. But just listening to that and reflecting on that is really where I see the power of the liturgy of the you the liturgy of the word and its intersection with the liturgy of the Eucharist. It brings us from the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And it clearly says that the word was God and the word was God. So the word that we just heard was God speaking into our hearts. If we unpack that scripture reading for us sitting in the pews, right? The word that we just listened to was God. And what happens? He is about now to become flesh and make his dwelling among us. That, that's the like You're looking for a description of the Mass, a quick description of the Mass. That's the easiest thing to quote, <laughs> right? The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. That's how I explain Mass to somebody who has absolutely no idea what Mass is uh, because it's, you know, it, it's the easiest and quickest explanation, and it's scriptural. So uh, I just want to— Great way to do it, Bill. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I love to hear that. I just—as you were doing it, I was trying to really focus, and we can do the same thing when we go to Mass, right? And so I think that was great that Bill took the time to read that because that's something that we should all do is— and even reading it aloud, I think that really helps us to pay attention. I do also, before we move on to the, the last two parts that I was going to discuss, which are the creed and the prayers of the faithful, is just to make a shout out to our audience, you know, the, the families in crisis, especially through the St. Raymond and Otis Foundation. I'm sure the Patchwork Heart Ministry, same thing. I mean, they they also help and, and work with people who are in crisis as well. And so I, I would just say that as you're listening to us talk, as you're partaking in this series and in this podcast today is I want to make that invitation to you too. You might be watching this and thinking, you know what? I've been away from mass. You know, my family is going through something very challenging right now and we have not been going to, to weekly mass. Well, this is your invitation to come back. So I wanted to make sure that I said that because that's our mission. The mission of the St. Raymond and Otis Foundation is pastoral accompaniment for families in crisis through the spiritual works of mercy. And, and Patchwork Hard Ministry has done so much with us, for us, and we work together. And we're just so happy to be able to bring these wonderful uh, events to you, these online events. So I personally thank Bill um, for joining us and, and producing this too. We couldn't do it without Bill, right? Bill's amazing. So let's go on to talk about the creed and also the prayers of the faithful, the last two sections. Um, in this same article I was referring to, it says that in our surrounding culture, we encounter beliefs that are in direct conflict with our faith. Relativism, for example, is very popular. The belief that there is no universal truth, especially regarding matters of morality and religion. In the creed, we proclaim the opposite. We proclaim that the uni that we are not an accident through, uh, through excuse me, we are not, not an accident brought about by chance, that God has a divine plan, that good and evil truly exist, and we can know them. Now, there's a lot more in this article, which you can read, but I wanted to make sure that I read that. You know, that's what when we proclaim that creed. We're proclaiming what we believe as Catholics. So we do need to do that every Sunday. It doesn't happen when we go to daily mass to do the the, the creed, the full creed, but um, but we do do it every Sunday. Now, the last part is the prayers of the faithful. It says the liturgy, the word concludes with a prayer for all the faithful of the community and around the world, as well as for men, uh, as well as for all men, also a very early practice mentioned by St. Justin Martyr. St. Paul already encouraged his communities to pray for kings and governors and his ministry and his ministry and needs. During this time, we also lift up the souls of the faithful departed and any other intentions of our hearts. And as I said in the first episode, I said that the importance also of praying for whoever that mass is for, that's part of what the liturgy of the word is all about too. So when those prayers of the faithful come around and they announce who the mass was for, you can pray for whoever that person was. I think that is extremely important to do. And also we can have masses said too for our family and friends. And I do that personally, I do that at my own parish uh, I arrange for several masses throughout the year, try to do them on the weekends too, so that I can attend the masses. 
So um, I just think that's a beautiful thing, Bill. As we conclude, I didn't know if you had any final words on what I just discussed. Yeah, you know, I think uh, having uh, those elements of the creed and the prayer of the faithful are a beautiful spot to put them in the Mass. Like when you think about where we're going, right? We're going to the altar and we, especially when we are bringing our intentions to the altar so that God can, God can hear, hear us. And we, we ask him to listen to our hearts, right? That, that's one of the responses, like, Lord, hear our prayer, right? And so we ask him to listen to our hearts and we ask him to understand us and our needs. And it's a perfect place to put it because we've just listened to, to God speak to us through Scripture. And now we're going to take the needs that we have, the, the things that we have, and place them at the foot of the altar. Bring them up. You know, you, you, we, we look at the preparation of the gifts that begins the liturgy of the Eucharist. And we're going to talk about that in our next you know, segment. But when you, when you think about what precedes that, it's the prayer of the faithful. And we, we speak those needs out, and then we bring them up to the altar. And so the, so the placement of that, I think, Anne, is, is really important for us to, re, to remember. You know, the, we, we conclude the liturgy of the Word with bringing what we are looking for from God this week to, to the altar and so that God can then begin His transformation process within our hearts. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, you, you, know we, you said it earlier, it kind of all ties together, right? <laughs> and it's so important to remember that. This all ties together. We can't just segment this. I mean, we can segment it in a podcast, but we can't segment Liturgy of the Eucharist, Liturgy of the Word. Like, like it just, it, it, it's one whole beautiful mass um, that, that we get to encounter. And without, without the Liturgy of the Word, it's, it's not a full mass. So, um, you know, just remember, just remember that. Uh, it's, it's not a mass without the Liturgy of the, of the Word. Um, so we've got to have both hand in hand and the word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us in the mass. And we get to talk about that next, next time, the dwelling among us part, which is super fun. <laughs> so thanks, Anne. This has been wonderful. It really has, Bill. Thank you so much. So join us for part three, where we're going to talk about the liturgy of the Eucharist. We'll see all of you next time for part three of an exploration of the mass. God bless. See you then. Thank you.